<laughs> that was so funny, James. <laughs> Welcome back to Pass Gas, a car history podcast by Donut Media. I'm your host. You're Nolan just really Sykes. like just kind of doing the same thing, but worse. Okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Last week we introduced you guys to the infamous racing team Midnight, more commonly and incorrectly known as the Midnight Club. We not only talked about the stringent qualifications to join the group, but also the precautions that members have to take to preserve their anonymity. And baby, Mm. that was only the beginning. We had only just begun to dip our sexy little toes into the waters that are midnight. Fast ass podcast. It's about cars. It's not about sports. Today. We're not just going to go in-depth on the cars that participated. We're also going to clear up a few more popular myths and untrue rumors about the group and its members. And we're going to talk about the end of the Midnight Club. But at the end of this episode, we have a special message from Racing Team Midnight themselves. That's so cool. That's awesome. So stick around for that. That's called a teaser. That's Do you, you think... I was about to ask. I was oh, like, "Do no. you think we're like honorary members?" No. <laughs> but like, even by asking that, it's like, "No, no, no you stupid idiot." <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Team Midnight. <laughs> I'm like the opposite. Like we yeah. literally wear all the clothes that you and I wear. Literally have our club's name <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna begin this episode by reiterating one of the most essential rules that all members had to follow. Preserve the group's anonymity at all costs. Only a select few people outside of the group were even given access to any information concerning Racing Team Midnight. While there were many strict rules imposed by the members, there was one rule more important than any other. Do not talk to Western media. Other media was Okay. Uh, for a while, team Racing Team Midnight members would feature their cars in Japanese auto magazines, such as Top Speed. But once they became more and more infamous, all press interactions were ceased. In fact, members of Midnight are so strict on this rule that it, it was impossible to find any short stories or anecdotes for this episode. So sorry. We're going <laughs> to be sorry, mostly speaking about the cars. Uh, this was due to fear that any detail, no matter how tiny, could lead to the identities of the members being exposed. Uh, They have placed a strict embargo on the information that could be shared. Again, if you guys haven't listened to episode one for some reason, um, go listen to to that. But if you haven't and you're lazy and don't want to go do that, uh, a lot of the information out there on the internet about Racing Team Midnight is untrue. It's deliberately written to protect the identities of the members. These guys are very powerful men. And street racing is illegal deeply illegal over in Japan. So if they were to be proven members of the club, um, their whole careers could be ruined, you know? Yeah. So take what you read online with a grain of salt and just trust us. <laughs> yeah. For have, some reason, trust us, tr- trust us that we have the correct information. Our source was a, uh, a guy that we interviewed. He was embedded with midnight club. For Let's call him years. Mr. X. Mr. We'll refer to him as Mr. X. He was embedded with the club, with the team. Uh, for a few years, and um, I, I believe a lot of what he told us, so I think it's pretty accurate. All right, like we said on the last episode, what made the members of Midnight so unique was their ability to tune every aspect of their cars to make the ultimate top speed machine. The members were offered to use the Yatabi high speed test track, um, but they needed something that would more accurately, accurately simulate real world conditions. Nothing simulated real-world conditions better than the real world. So they took their cars onto the Wangan Highway. The Wangan Highway is not exactly the most comfortable road to travel at high speeds over, you know, 100 miles 100 an hour. Miles an hour. <laughs> Expansion joints in the highway would cause cars to violently shake as they went over each bump, literally throwing the car Into the air if uh, speeds were high enough. So highly tuned precision suspension was necessary for the drivers to not lose control on these bumps. Having a good suspension was not only necessary to maintain top speed, but was essential in reaching top speed safely. One gun racing wasn't about hopping in your car and going as fast as you can. It was about perfecting the suspension systems and braking systems, as well as perfectly tuning your engine transmission every aspect of the car not only had to be mastered it had to be james it had to be perfected racing on wangan was more or less an art form 
if you were a performance shop, which is why Midnight always excelled above the rest because these guys ran big companies. <laughs> yeah. They had the resources mm-hmm. to do this. Yeah. They, like, I think the biggest thing about these guys is they're not jackasses. Yeah. You know, they have all these rules in place to protect the public. They tune every single aspect of their car. They're not just like hooning around, being dorks. They're not jackasses. Remember, they're not racing, they're testing. To that point, if there's one thing that Racing Team Midnight stood out above all the other competition for was their understanding that power, power is nothing without control. So sometimes these cars would be reaching speeds of over 200 miles per hour. They would have less than 600 horsepower. That's that's super impressive. Yeah, that's super impressive. It's not about making the most power. It's about how well you can use the power, yeah. which I think... That makes sense. Yeah. I'm, on, I'm on board. I don't know if Enzo Ferrari would be totally on board, right? Because he was all about, like... He like the power. He like the power. Like he said, aerodynamics is for people who can't build race <laughs> engines, which is hilarious. Yeah, it's like, uh... <laughs> kind of on the wrong side of yeah. history for that one. <laughs> Why we need to cut that through the air? It is not the knife, but the hammer. <laughs> one uh, one midnight member once said in an now infamous quote that drifting and autocross <laughs> is for pussies. Hell yeah! We only do maximum velocity. Nice. That's that's so <laughs> sick. <laughs> that is so sick. Uh, that really kind of highlights the members' focus on the precision of their work. On the Wangan. To members of Midnight, drifters and autocross would just throw more power on their cars recklessly to achieve better results. But to be successful on the highway, you had to master every element of your vehicle. These cars had to be tuned right to even stand a chance on the Tomei and Wangan. Team Midnight drivers would drive their cars on the highway at over 212 miles an hour for over five to seven minutes at a time in the mid-1990s. And they would do this for up to six hours a night in 15-minute intervals. That Bike is so long yeah. to drive that fast. One, I've never driven over 200 miles an hour. But every time I've, like, topped out a car, yeah. it's like, ooh! Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately start slowing down. These guys are just, like, cooking. That's insane. That's so long. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, by comparison, the fastest car on the road in 1999 was the Lamborghini Diablo with a top speed of 202 miles per hour. At top speed, the Lamborghini could only last about three minutes before the engine overheated. Uh, by comparison, the cars, the, the midnight cars, would last over five times that amount. To bring in a modern day comparison, uh, like the Bugatti Veyron. With the power of, I mean, that's got a. It's got an eight liter W16 engine. Make. Quad turbo. Quad turbo. Yeah, it's got like 16 radiators on it. Anyway, it can achieve a top speed. Of 400 kilometers per hour, which is uh, 240 about, uh, but only for about 12 minutes before it completely g- drains its gas tank. Yeah, these guys get bigger gas tanks or what? I guess, and they're just stopping for gas. Dude, these guys must have been like burning cash <laughs> at gas stations. Yeah, like, you're filling up again? Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you're probably like stopping. What are you doing? You're probably stopping for gas like twice three, a night. Yeah, at least. Yeah, we're talking about like. A lot of the, yeah, six cylinder cars. A lot of them were like twin turbo. You could never do this in LA because you'd, like, you'd go broke in like yeah. a week. <laughs> um, there were GTRs, Porsches, Nissan Z32s. Uh, some of the most eye catching cars, though, were the L- Lamborghini Countach's. Most notably, a Walter Wolf Special Countach, the only one like it in the world. But we might expand on that car in another day. But this day is not that day. And on this day, we got to hear about our sponsors. That's right. Out of all the cars that participated in Racing Team Midnight, the one that stood out the most was the legendary ABR Hosoki Engineering S13OZ. Nope. (laughs) S130Z. S130Z. It was a highly modified 1978 Nissan Fairlady Z that was capable of speeds just over 200 miles an hour. That is crazy. um, I thought I wouldn't be able to find pictures of this because it's a midnight car, and I was like, oh, this is a secret thing. I looked it up on Google. You can find tons of pictures of it. It's It's, 280ZX. It's pretty sick is what it is, James. super sick. The ABR Hisoki S130 produced upwards of 800 horsepower on its 
best tune. That's insane. That's insane. I wonder how much of this is true. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we've talked so much about how much misdirection there is mm-hmm. on the internet and how, you know, like, there's just this lore about this team and these guys. Yeah. Like, there's a freaking comic book yeah. about them. And, like, 800 horsepower on, what is it, like, that L20? A great example of how this how Midnight pushed the edge. Um, it The 2.8 liter L series was bored out to three liters. It had an intercooled turbo, which I guess was uncommon for the time. Uh, a reserve fuel tank. That's, yeah. Oil catch can. Intercooler sprayers to keep the air cool. Um, so, like, an intercooler sometimes isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Little sprayers, the condensed water helps... Um, make the uh, the air yeah. even colder and thus denser, thus creating more horsepower. Um, the suspension in the rear was swapped out to independent suspension. So this could, is just a great build. Yeah, man, this thing's super cool. A lot of the bodywork was replaced with carbon fi- fiber panels, which it, that's, in the yeah in the eighties that's like un yeah early nineties. Like okay, I think carbon fiber started coming in. Like they developed that stuff so like they could build. The F-117 stealth bomber back in, like, the 70s, <laughs> yeah. the one that looks like a spa- literal spaceship, mm-hmm. and they're using this on a freaking Datsun. <laughs> 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 that's crazy. <laughs> um, but to your point about if that's an accurate number, I like mean, that's a three-liter engine making that much, I'm not quite sure on that. But, yeah. I mean, like, the turbocharged... Um, F1 engines of the time, they were making, like, a 1,000 horsepower, sometimes even 1,200 horsepower in, like, the qualifi- qualifying spec. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I it's insane, but considering the people that were on Midnight, I believe it. Wow. Yeah. Um, in 2002, this car was brought to America to compete at the Nevada Speed Week on a closed highway. The car placed best in class, smoking modern-day cars while using a tune from the 1980s. <laughs> What was so remarkable about this car specifically is that almost every panel was replaced with a composite part of some kind. It had been disassembled and stitch welded back together in the same way a race car is, also with a built-in roll cage. So they started off, you know, racing just their modded up cars wearing helmets. Now they've got full on racing safety equipment in these things. I think here is where Team Midnight is like eclipsing their original intent. Mm -hmm. Like how much money do you need? Right. Again, because we have to remember this is also taking place at a time when Japan had a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And it's like, fuck it, dude. Let's just see what we can do. Yeah. The owner of the Yoshida Special had a habit of running around Wangan lit only by overhead lights, refraining the use of his headlights, and sometimes running in total darkness. When the owner did challenge people, which was rare, he would flash all four of his high beams, two in the stock location and two of the aftermarket ones that we talked about mm-hmm. last episode, in the competitor's window to signal, ch- to signal a challenge. Of course, the Yoshida special always won, without exception. He garnered the nickname Blackbird, Blackbird as he appeared black as night, despite his car actually being a very deep red color. Oh, he was, he That's was, interesting. Yeah, he was also Blackbird was red. Redbird. That's Red kind Bird. of a cool name too. The, Jim Redbird. <laughs> My name's Jim Red. Jim Redbird. <laughs> Jim Redburn. Um, he was also viewed as a harbinger of imminent loss or death, must much like a blackbird or crow in real life. Okay, no wonder there's so much legend about this. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's that's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> The Yoshida 930 Special Blackbird also became famous years later, like we said, in One God Midnight, competing against a blue S30Z, uh, loosely based on the specifications of the ABR Hosoki. Um, but despite what anime folklore you may have heard, rivalries did not really exist between team members. They would occasionally host speed battles on the Atabe, where they would compare top speeds down to the last kilometer per hour to, de- uh, to determine a winner. But it was all done in good fun. Um, When members were feeling really competitive, they would compare top speeds on a section of Wangan between Chiba and Yokohama. This section of the highway was uh, really was well known for its continuous straightaway, which made it the perfect ground for the midnight vehicles. Outside the team is where the real rivalries began. Companies such as Top Secret, you ever heard of it? Uh, It was owned by a guy named Smokey Nagata, who is a... Rumored to be a member of Team Midnight. 
Veilside, Signal, Auto, June, and HKS, they were all trying to be at Team Midnight. And those are like those are those, those are the heaviest hitters yeah. in Yeah, I've heard of all Japanese those. cars. Yes. No other groups could ever compete with Midnight. But that didn't stop them from trying. One company, West Racing, imported a C4 <laughs> Corvette and modified it specifically to face off against Midnight. The Corvette was tuned to an excess of a thousand wheel horsepower. Now we say wheel horsepower sometimes, and mm -hmm. I think some listeners, if you don't know, there is a difference between stated horsepower and wheel horsepower. And like the name suggests, wheel horsepower is the actual power that the tires are putting down onto the road. A lot of cars will lose about 20% of the horsepower from the engine to the tires just through the drive line and transmission and all that. Got all those parts to move. Yeah, exactly. So a thousand wheel horsepower is a lot. That's a lot. And it proved to be a big mistake. Even though the C4 could put down a shit ton of power, uh, the guys that built it could never correctly tune the car to handle that much, even with excessive modifications to both the suspension and engine. I'm going to say that this car was probably, it wasn't overbuilt. It was built to the limit, but probably couldn't make the power reliably. And just mm -hmm. tire technology back then is nowhere near where it was now. Mm -hmm. And that's something that makes this, all, this whole story more impressive is that they were able to do these insane runs on tires from the 80s. The uh, only car that could begin to compete with the Midnight was G.A. Mitsunga's Tomir Monster Pantera, which was famous for its 307 0.69 kilometer an hour Yatabe run, proving that it was possible to get close to the Midnight cars. But Mitsunga was the exception, not the rule. Overall, the Midnight Club proved time and time again to be basically unbeatable. The Midnight cars would also face off against top tier manufacturers. They would meet up at the Yatabe to prove the capability of their modified cars against high end supercars at the time. Now, we didn't say anybody specific. I bet Porsche probably bought. Brought their cars because mm -hmm. around that time the the 959 was out, wasn't it? Yep. I bet they brought it. Like, of course, there aren't any concrete sources for yeah. this stuff. We're just fantasizing at this. This point. is conjecture. What I'm about to say is conjecture. They probably brought the 959, the roof, or some of their GT car, like GT3 cars. Yeah, the Ferrari F40 was out. Yeah, yeah, they probably. Eh, I don't know. I bet. I bet Ferrari never went to the Utah. Yeah. Of course, where there is success. There are also imitators. Some of the biggest rivals of Racing Team Midnight were teams that were created in a vain attempt to beat them. Other teams would try to compete and would run names that in the end were just rip-offs of the original Midnight name. These fake teams would, be, would name themselves such things as Half Moon Knight or Wolf Sun, which is actually that's pretty <laughs> sick, that's pretty sick. Uh, or any other combination of mysterious-sounding English words slapped together. What would your racing team call, be called? Wolf Sun's pretty good. Yeah, but that's already taken. Oh, Boost Creeps. Boost Creeps. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. That's good enough. Yeah. So the, the common theme between these smaller teams trying to beat Midnight is that they were looking for notoriety mm -hmm. and fame. Which is uh, the opposite. Yeah, that's the opposite of Midnight. And they just wanted to say that they could beat Midnight. Uh, they would frequently set records for extremely specific and arbitrary scores, such as getting the fastest run between, you know, exit this and exit that, just so they can say they could do it faster than Midnight. Meanwhile, Midnight was like, we don't care. Yeah. I'm sorry. Are you are you the one selling these parts that we're developing? Yeah. Oh, you're not? Thanks for buying yeah. them, though. Yeah, exactly. Of course, there are plenty of people who competed against Midnight who had actually tried to become members beforehand. One of the more famous names is Smokey Nagata, the owner of Top Secret. He had long been a rumor to be a member of Midnight, but that was another distraction Intentionally seeded onto the Wikipedia page. <laughs> it's distraction, man. To dis uh, divert attention it's from any real members. Yeah. In fact, Smokey Nagata was denied membership to the group for being too reckless. At the time, Smokey was taking his famous gold colored top secret cars around the world and making top speed runs, including one that got him in serious trouble over in the United Kingdom. James. How would you read this next section with a British accent? Smokey had built one of the most batshit, insane Supras ever. He yanked out the stock's twin turbocharged 2JZ engine and replaces it with a 5-liter, 12-cylinder, 1GZ FE from Toyota's Century Executive Limousine. 
But that wasn't enough. He bolted an HKS turbo onto either side and used two ECUs to control the engine. Legend has it that this Supra made 930 horsepowers and 745 pounds of torque. This thing had a crazy aerodynamic body kit and suspension that could adjust itself on the fly. And, to top it all off, a very nice gold paint, the colour of the Queen's crown. <laughs> Smokey was gunning for 200 miles per hour, so he shipped the car to England. He hopped on the somewhat straight A1 expressway, where he was able to reach a speed of 197 miles per hour before being arrested by the Johnnies and spending <laughs> a few days in London Tower. <laughs> Thanks. Which is what we call jail here. <laughs> um, members of Racing Team Midnight didn't want that sort of risk and publicity centered around their group, so understandably they denied him membership. So. Uh, yeah, try again next year, dummy. <laughs> the group is really good at protecting their members' identities. A good rule of thumb is that you have ever heard a rumor that someone is or was involved with Midnight Club. Chances are that it's blatantly false usually planted in order to divert attention from the real members. Popular rumored members include Akaichi Suchia, um, the, the guy based... From Option Magazine. Yeah, from Option Magazine. Uh, or Junichi Tanaka of June Performance House. Uh, and they were never involved with the club. Also, just to put into perspective, the guy who started Option Magazine and the dude who fucking founded June aren't... Allowed yeah. in the club. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Many of these people who are rumored to be in it tried to become members, but uh, they found out that it was pretty, it's a pretty rigorous process. Um, there's only one applicant who was completely banished after a frame weld he made on a member's car failed at high speed, nearly killing the guy. The group has always been very secretive about the number of accidents that have occurred within Midnight. Originally, they didn't want anything to do that would put pedestrians at risk, but also they didn't want to die themselves. At one point, an unnamed member with a black FC3S, that's a RX-7. That's a second gen, no, third gen RX-7. Uh, he died in an accident on Wan Gan, but they still continued to drive it after his death. Apparently, members still meet yearly to pay their respects. It's rumored that this member's dedication to the club was so strong that the fellow Midnight teammates... Um, carved a marble gravestone in the shape of the <laughs> of his FC. It was RX seven. Yeah, at the sp like near the spot. That's crazy. Um, so despite their their goal to be safe, mm -hmm. there were a few more major accidents within the club and two accidents outside the club involving pedestrians. So the members that hit people, but they keep the details of those accidents close to their chests. Understandably. One time I went to a bar and there was a really long line to get in and I had to pee, but it, the line was too long, so I had an accident outside the club. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the details of only one of their accidents is publicly known about, and that was the accident that took place in 1999. We, this is the end of Racing Team Midnight. In 1999, a few Bozuzoku bikers wanted to play with some of Team Midnight as they were racing down the highway. Despite it being a rule not to accept challenges from these guys, a few of the Midnight team members accepted because they're like, hey, we could probably beat these guys' ass. And before they knew it, they were traveling at incredibly high speeds into a high traffic area. The high concentration of traffic led to a chain reaction collision pileup that resulted in the deaths of two of the Bozuzoku gang members as well as hospitalizing eight other motorists. Because it not harming a civilian was so important to the club, when this happened, they immediately announced that they were disbanding the whole club. And they publicly vowed to never race again. And that is that. That is the end of the Midnight Club, you know? Um, officially. Officially, that's they ended the club. Um, this is how I've always heard it. And that probably goes for everyone else. 
But <gasps> what? That's not the entire story. What? That's called a Mister X. Oh no! Uh -huh! Got me again. <laughs> When the club formally disbanded, all they really did was start refusing to do any magazine and video publications of any kind. They informed every outlet that they had disbanded, but in reality, the club never stopped. <gasps> Members of Racing Team Midnight are still active to this day. They just refuse to tell anyone of its existence. Sorry, Team Midnight. You're still here. <laughs> uh, while the club still operates today, it is no, it's not anywhere near the same level of operation was in its prime. Members apparently still meet for yearly dinners, uh, <laughs> which I think is adorable. I love, it. I love that. I would love to go. I want to have a yearly dinner with, with some of my friends. Yeah. Uh, and occasionally they meet in smaller groups with their cars for a few spirited drives on the Wangen for the good old days. There's no longer the focus on developing new parts and leading the world in performance. In fact, new road restrictions in Japan have made it almost impossible for any group to have nearly the success that Midnight had on the Wangen. Japan has pretty crazy speed limits, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and cameras and shit. Cameras have advanced. Um, radar. Radar. Also. Lasers. Well, now the, the tax on cars is really high too, right? Like mm -hmm. The bigger your engine is, the more taxes you pay on it. That's why supercars are pretty rare over there because they have mm. so like you have to pay taxes per liter. That's interesting. Yeah. Primarily now, the Midnight Club is a group of friends who drive cars fast and meet for dinner. <laughs> I love it. I love that. <laughs> so awesome. And while still upholding the initial core standards of the group, they well, still hold on. <laughs> like, what? We know a lot of that's us. Yeah, we know rich guys that have <laughs> yeah, fast cars, yeah. and that's what they. <laughs> rich guys love taking their cool ass cars to meets and parking lots, uh -huh. going on drives down. Like a canyon, and then going to like Nobu afterwards. Yeah, and that's what these guys are doing. That's what these guys are doing. Yeah, there's all rich guys. <laughs> <laughs> Over uh, time, racing team Midnight has certainly mellowed out. Yeah, because these guys are like old now. Yeah, they're <laughs> old. Um, but so has the Japanese tuner scene. Racing team Midnight has always been highly regarded as being a club that put pedestrian safety above their own, while still discovering cutting edge advancements in automotive tuning that would shape the world forever. They are probably one of the coolest secret racing organizations that many of us have never had the pleasure of hearing about. And that is why we are so glad to have been able to present this story to you. And now we have a oh. message from Team Midnight. And I know we kind of played it up uh, big. Um, it's sort of boring, <laughs> yeah. but that's how you know it's true. But that's how you know it's true. So we are delivering a message on behalf of Team Midnight, but it is about trademark law. <laughs> <laughs> so listen so, up. So we are literally delivering a message from the coolest secret society in our opinion, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any cool. No, this is like the coolest this. thing ever. Yeah. The freaking Japanese street racing Illuminati yeah. has trusted us to deliver a message to you guys. So trademark law is a complicated subject, um, but it's very useful if you own a business uh, and would like to protect your logo. It may seem like a small thing, but the midnight logo you see adorned on members' windshields or on those small stickers is in fact a registered trademark of Team Midnight. Members of Team Midnight have prided themselves on their high sense of morality and honor, and their cars wear the Midnight logo with pride. Unfortunately, there are multiple sources online to acquire counterfeit memorabilia bearing the Midnight name. The only way to acquire anything official with the Midnight name is to be honorably gifted the item by a member of the team. The logo is not available for public use. We have been requested to inform all of our listeners that people who wear shirts, decals, stickers, or any other midnight memorabilia <laughs> are not endorsed, nor are they respected by the team in any way. The logo is trademarked, and the team takes unlawful use of that logo very seriously. That's I'm. They're gonna sue you. <laughs> they're gonna sue you because they're rich men. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't steal people's <laughs> logos. I'm not. <laughs> this is the most absurd. What? 
I get I get where they're coming from. <laughs> I know. I, I there's I'm, some similar there's some logos out there that are yeah. quite similar to ours. Yeah. It pisses me off. And ideally they would stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um Yeah, so I mean I know that this episode was kinda mysterious, but that really is just the nature of this thing. That's why it's I mean, that's why it's lived on for so long. That's mm-hmm. why people know that's why there's a anime about a street racing team mm-hmm. from 30 years ago is because it is so mysterious and like you said it's the illuminati of street racing yeah. and it really is like i mean when you're doing something so cool it's in, it's so hard not to talk about it the they cars are impressive the organization is impressive the legacy is certainly impressive but probably the most impressive part is that they don't talk about it at all that's do you the know most how, impressive part dude do you know how much money they can make if they did a Netflix documentary yeah. on this thing, yeah. and they came out as like Team Midnight Unmasked, mm-hmm. I'd watch that in a second. I'd watch that, but in- they don't. They don't do it. I'd watch it twice. Yeah, or if they, or if they sold merch. Oh my god! If they like, do you know how many backpacks with racing straps you would <laughs> see at an FD event that said Team Midnight on the back? Yeah, and that- they could like sponsor a car. Oh my god! Like they could. Uh, they could have Team Midnight. Yeah. That'd be so cool. But they don't. But they don't because they don't need to talk about it. It's not about men. that. They just want to go to dinner. That's right. And I want to go to lunch. All right. Uh, you know the drill. If you like our podcast, please, please, please rate, review, and subscribe to it. It really does help us out. I know you guys are really sick of hearing it from all your favorite podcasts, but it's the only metric we have that we're doing a good job. So please do that. Oh, and... If you leave a review and it's funny, we'll read it on the air. How about that? Not too funny. Don't make fun of our voices or anything. Yeah, don't don't be yeah. We're sensitive. Yeah. Don't make fun of Nolan's stupid voice. What? <laughs> uh, follow me on Instagram at Nolan J Sykes. Follow Donut on Instagram and Twitter at Donut Media. Follow me on both of those at James Pumphrey. Tune in next week for the story of Randy Lanier. Racer Extraordinaire. And smuggler extraordinaire. <laughs> We're not good ra- about plums. <laughs> Re- good racer, better smuggler. <laughs> Was he better? I uh, only got caught. <laughs> yeah, not that good, but it's a good story. You know, I think I like to think of Nolan as sort of my protege. Mm-hmm. I like to mentor this young man. He's a great mentee. He's very smart, very talented. I appreciate. He's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Oh, and sometimes I like to teach Nolan things about comedy. Mm-hmm. You know, I've trained. In comedy, so today's lesson on is a misdirect, Whoa. which is what I just did. 